So um, I hope everybody got one of these handouts on the way in. Did you? Um, just felt like for your prayer time, if you want to meditate on some verses, it's very clear that we're in a season of spiritual warfare, right? If that's not clear to you by now, I don't know, we must be living in a different place. And uh, I just, you know, they're not really specifically in any order, these verses that I gave you, but just different prayer points that you can look at. Um, we'll try to focus on some of these things as January and February uh, roll out. Um, we're also bringing in speakers. Uh, we will do that again. We have one coming that uh, specializes in healing people of trauma. That'll be in March. So just the theme right now, that's what I said, 2021, 20, win the war for your altar. We all have a personal altar. That's where we spend time before the Lord. And it ties into this week's um, title. Uh, we've been covering different parts of that theme of the sanctity of life. Remember when Lisa Malolo came up and talked about how we're partnering with uh, First Choice Women's Resource Centers and we're trying to give people an alternative to an abortion, right? If a, if a pregnant girl needs help, that's what they're doing. There's five different locations around New Jersey. It's, it's a really top agency for this. Because as Christians, we can't just sit by idly and do nothing, right? If we do nothing, it means we don't really care. And we have to care. We have to care about the state of our nation and we got to get involved. We can't just complain about things. We've got to get involved and do things like David said, start partnering with food pantries. And you, can bring, you can bring food to church if you want. If you have children, while you're out shopping, once you get through your list, buy some more food for the people that need help. And then have your children write out a card and say, we're praying for you. You're never going to meet those people, but those people can feel the love of God coming through. Many are from other nations that aren't used to be people being generous. And when we did the Christmas outreach, we brought it to the high school because we have people that are working in the high school and specifically know the families that need the help the most, which is awesome. And it's all done uh, under, you know, uh, confidentially so that their names aren't being released or anything. We just give it to the counselors who are dealing with the families. And one of the letters we got back from one of the students who was there helping said, we just got here from Asia and we didn't grow up in a culture that had any generosity. We didn't have any idea what you were doing. Why would you bring food for free? Because we take it for granted here that we're a Christian country founded on Christian principles. As hard as the enemy tries to take those away, we're going to fight back. Amen? Say it a little louder, church. We're going to fight back. We're going to have free speech. We're going to, we're going to follow what the Constitution says and be a force for good. And, you know, maybe we got a little too lazy. Maybe we got too apathetic about getting involved. I don't think we should say, Jesus, hurry up and get us out of here. I think he said, occupy until I come. That we'll be busy about the Father's business. I have food that you don't know about, disciples. My food is to do the will of the one who sent me. Set captives free. Get people out of the mess they're in now. It's not just about waiting until we go to heaven, right? We have a job to do while we're here. And that's always going to be our philosophy. It's what we've done since the first day we came out here. Um, partly because Trish is such a, has a strong anointing in deliverance. We've been helping people with deliverance since the first day we started the church. I mean, she had a waiting list for people down in uh, Essex County where, where we were before we came out here. So God didn't give us these gifts to keep them up on the shelf. We're supposed to meet people where they're at and say, hey, God's going to help us get through this. God's going to use his power flowing through the church and flowing through Christians to see situations improve for the Lord. That's the way this works. And worship's a great thing that we did today. And that's why I put the picture of, of the guitar, me with the guitar because this comes out of Proverbs uh, 25 too, the, the text verse for today. Um, I called it living in the hiding place of God's glory. All right, that's a typical passion translation kind of phrase, right? The hiding place of God's glory. Wouldn't you love to live there? What's your address? The hiding place of God's glory. <laughs> that's where I live. And people are like, well, that's not practical. I have to go to work. I'm, I'm a busy guy. I'm too busy to pray. Don't say that. You're too busy not to pray. 
We just might mean something differently when we say pray. Like you think you have to just block everything else out and go and have your list ready and, and, and beg God. You don't have to do that. That's nothing wrong with bringing a list to God. But what about just inviting him into every situation during the day? He cares about everything we do. So why wouldn't we ask him? I'll tell you why. We're not used to people helping us. Maybe we didn't have a good father. Maybe our father or mother just was too busy to be bothered with us. And sometimes we translate that to how that's how God looks at us. Can we break that lie right now? That is not how God looks at us. He never slumbers. He never sleeps. Whatever's important to you, it's important to him because you're his child. And we have the spirit of adoption in us that cries out, Abba, Father. That's a very intimate term. Daddy. And I don't know about you, but I didn't have that picture of God when I was growing up. So it's something that we have to be very intentional about. This is one way to do it. I'm going to live in the hiding place of God's glory. It's not just a special service when we come to church. It is wonderful to all be together and worship together like we did today. I don't want to stop. I was saying to the guys in the back, I love it when I take my earplugs out and my ears are numb. Because I'm sitting basically right on top of those drums. And don't we like having real drums back, church? Yes. Got to thank the guys in the booth. They work really hard. And uh, go ahead, give them a hand. Because that's an important job. Um, so the, the actual verse uh, that that comes from, that that title comes from, is 25.2 in the Passion. God conceals the revelation of his word in the hiding place of his glory. Okay. That takes us up to a whole other level, right? Because then it says the honor of kings is revealed by how they thoroughly search out the deeper meaning of all that God says. All right? We're kings and priests, and we don't just sit back and wait for God to do it. We are diligent seekers after God, right? That's Hebrews 11. God rewards those who diligently seek after him. So right after God conceals the revelation of his word in the hiding place of his glory... It's because we need to go there with a sober mind. We need to ask him, Lord, you said we were kings and priests, and the honor of kings is revealed by how they thoroughly search out the deeper meaning of all that God says. And I think most of you that have been saved any amount of time know the longer you're a Christian, the more you realize it's an endless treasure of truth. Fair enough? The Bible? You could read it and go back and read it again front to back, and find all new things every time you go back through it. It's the revelation of God, but it's also that you're maturing. And as you mature as a Christian, you look at that verse and you see it differently now through more seasoned eyes, don't you? And you know, one of the reasons people don't like to read the Bible is because it's very convicting. <laughs> you know, we see how we're supposed to live, and then we look in the mirror and we realize we fell short. And instead of just humbling ourselves and getting down on our knees, we say, yeah, I think I'll read the sports page. <laughs> What's going on in the basketball playoffs, right? Like, you know, you just keep putting it off. Maybe I'll go get my teeth drilled. Because I want to avoid that conviction that Holy Spirit brings. Like, no, it's not. The honor of kings is revealed by how they thoroughly search out the deeper meaning of all that God says. And I'll just draw a comparison because you all know that I'm still in the workforce and I'm always on appointments and going to meeting, but many unsafe people who are successful because, you know, our firm helps them invest the money. So they're typically successful people. That's how they got the money, right? And, and it's very black and white, very down, you know, get to the point. What do you got? You know, you'll walk in, what do you got? Like, hurry up, get to the point. And, um, you know, that's not how God is. But why wouldn't you pray before you go in there and say, Lord, I want to know exactly the right words to say to this person because I believe what I can do is going to help him. I'm not trying to sell him something. I believe that the services that we have can help them. But I want to do it in a way that he can receive it or she can receive it, not just my standard pitch. Right? Nobody wants to be pitched. They want you to care about what they are, what, what, what their life is about. They want you to listen. Right? You know that saying, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's missing in our culture right now, isn't it? So everything that the Bible teaches us should cause us to prosper in the business world because it's, it's based on character. It's based on doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do and not bowing to the pressure of a sales manager. You didn't make your numbers. You didn't make your numbers. Go back into the hiding place of his glory. Pray and say, Lord, help me find favor with the people that I meet. I'll do my part. 
I'll go out and, and go on the appointments and I want you, when I open up my mouth, I want you to speak through me, right? So verse 28 is kind of like this picture of a life without prayer. I lived it for a long time. I thought I was praying. I wasn't not ever praying, but it wasn't the understanding of prayer that I have now. And I've said it before, but you know, my wife is very strong in that gift. That's, that's one of the things that she's helped me realize because I would say, I think we should do this. And she'd say, what did the Lord say? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't have to bother him with this one. This is easy. It's like, no, that's, that's a really good way to live. What did the Lord say before you do anything? Because most things are not that urgent that you can't just wait. And it's amazing what he'll show you when you pray and you just ask. So that's part of that living in the hiding place of his glory is that that's where I'll hear, hear the right voice, right? So, you know, that verse from the Psalms that says it's, it's vain to stay up late and work hard because unless the Lord builds the house, you're just going to labor in vain. So that's a good word for 2021, right? Because there's a swirl going around about us in the atmosphere right now. People are very disappointed. A lot of Christians are very disappointed about the way the, way the election has gone up till now. And um, I don't want anybody to think that I'm not praying for that. I am praying for that. But I do think that we do have to also honor the, the rule of law in America, right? That's, that's what makes us great. We honor the rule of law. And, and if it was, there was fraud involved, you God will show us where the evidence is. That evidence, evidence will get presented in a court. And that's how, that's how it works here. And you should be happy about that. Because you can go to other countries called banana republics. Right? And it's not selling clothes. We have rights here. And that's what makes us great. Is that we honor the rule of law. That we're not just riding in the streets. And look, I, I believe it's true that the church has just gotten too comfortable and bought into this lie that, that we're not relevant for the culture, that this is just the theory that we talk about here, but you can't apply it on your job. I mean, come on, really? How come Paul stayed being a tent maker? Jesus was a carpenter till he was 30, right? Like, these people all were working, fishermen, tax collectors, all people out in the market among the lost all the time. Even Paul, as this great scholar that he is with all this ministry, when you read about him in, in uh, Ephesus. He was going on his lunch break from his job. He was making tents. And, the, and they would come to him and say, can we borrow your, your canvas uh, vest that you had on? I'm not a vest. I can't think of it. Like a smock almost because he would keep his tools in there. Because we know you're going to go teach in the hall of Tyrannus during your lunch break. But there's sick people that we want to see healed and we can't get them to you so we want to bring your smock and your bandana, your handkerchief, and your apron to them. And they would bring those work clothes and lay them on people, and those people would get healed. It was while he was working. It's not supposed to just happen in church. Yes, Lord, let it happen here, but let it happen everywhere we go. Because we're carrying the presence of God with us, and we can't ever th think, oh, no, he wouldn't want me to use it here. He wants you to be careful how you use it. All right, and, and, and let's not bring a reproach on the Lord by misrepresenting him. But that's why the honor of kings is revealed by how thoroughly they search out the deeper meaning. But, but the prayerlessness part I didn't read yet, but it says, verse 28 of Proverbs 25, whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Okay, that's a very profound truth from the day we started this church in 1999. I this is one of the most highly quoted verses that have come out of my mouth since we've been out here. Because we forget sometimes that when you look at what's listed as evidence of the Holy Spirit, the fruit, right? The fruit that the Spirit is operating in you is love, joy, peace, patience, right? You know kindness. And then there's that last one in the King James. It was called temperance, right? Self-control. Boy, if, if there's any group of people that should be able to Defer to the power of God in us in the Holy Spirit and say, give me control so that I'm not this person who's not ruling my spirit because a city with the walls broken down means you're open for attack. And that's why the devil just loves to get people emotionally hijacked. Or back in my college days, we always wanted to get the girl drunk because we knew if we could get her... I wasn't saved then, okay, I'm not trying to tell any bad stories, but, but we knew that... 
if we could get the girl drunk, her, her guard would go down, right? It was diabolical. It's what the devil does. You know, whatever. I won't go into that. But look, the devil will twist all the desires in our heart uh, to, the, to the ungodly side. Desires aren't bad. They just have to be under the rulership of the Lord, yeah. right? That's what James says in James chapter 1. We, we fall because we're drawn away by our desires and enticed. But the desires aren't bad in and of themselves because what about William Wilberforce? He had the desire to see slavery end in England. That's a good desire. It took him 30 years against all odds. Three days before he died, he saw it happen. Amazing. So it's not the desires that are bad. It's are they sanctified? Meaning, have they been put through the lens of Scripture? Have, have we lived it out? Have we walked it out among other people? Like, who, who would you ask for a pastoral reference? And what would they say? Right? That's a good way to think about this. Like, what's my reputation? Am I late every time I'm, I'm called to a meeting? Well, okay. I mean, that's not the end of the world, but it's probably not the highest standard that we would want to live by, right? How about your boss? What would your boss say in your annual review? You got a toot, man. Got a bad attitude. No, I don't want that. I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to be carrying the Holy Spirit with me. I don't want to be hijacked by emotions and say things they're going to use against me later. So, Lord, help me not be this guy who I have no rule over my spirit and then I'm open to attack. So I go into that hiding place of his glory and I say, Lord, I really need help in this area because I'm getting all riled up about whatever this thing is or the, the betrayal that happened or somebody said something on Facebook and Accuse me of being whatever. That's where you go into that closet of prayer and you say, Lord, remove these wicked thoughts from my mind right now. Because we can think of some pretty ugly things to do to people, can't we? (laughs) And just because you didn't say it doesn't mean it's okay. (laughs) All right, you'll get honest with me here in a minute. (laughs) So right now, part of this huge swirl and the disappointment is that we understand that the the Democratic platform is not pro-life, right? That's very obvious. It was stated right from the beginning. And we are pro-life, okay? Can we just say that, this church? We are pro-life. I can't find any other opinion to have after reading this front to back. God really cares about life. And we believe it starts when the first two cells are joined together because we're created in God's image, And it's amazing that we know that up here, but when we're speaking badly to somebody else, we forget that they're made in God's image too. So there's this trap that we can fall into that we're not really using the best language that we could be. Excuse me. So remember when they they confronted Jesus in Mark chapter 12 and they said, is it right that we should pay taxes, right? The temple tax. And he said, bring me a coin. Whose image is on the coin? Remember this? And they were surprised by that answer. It said, he said, just give unto Caesar the things that are his and give unto God the things that are God's. And he could have said, whose image is on you? <laughs> you're made in God's image. So you're supposed to give yourself to God. Yeah, you can pay the tax to the temple, but you better be making your offering of your life up to him. That is if you want to prosper and succeed and, and have favor in your life. It comes through obedience. So we can't take a stand for pro-choice. We think that the rights of the unborn child override the rights of the mother because the mother went into it. Now, look, I know if it's rape and I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes, I understand that there's a lot of variations on what we're talking about here, but in general, okay, just in general, for the massive majority of what we're talking about, it's we don't believe that that's a godly principle. Nor do we believe that our young children should be getting a curriculum in school that says they can choose whatever gender they want, okay? No, sorry, really. Like so much of of being a Christian is taking your identity first as a child of God. Like you said, I think a little earlier, right? Uh, Rich, was it you? I don't remember. But we take our identity as children of God before anything else. So the fact that we're made in God's image is we're image bearers of Christ as we walk around through the culture and we go about our business. And Paul was doing it as a tent maker. I do it on Wall Street. You do it wherever you go. And you're going to interact with people and and you're going to say things differently than I would say them. And that's awesome. God loves that. And yes, there are times that people are not representing God properly, but 
We can only do what we can do. We can handle our half of that equation, right? So I talked about expressing the essence of God's true nature from inside of us, that Psalm 2 talks about the, the heathen rage, and we have to remember Ephesians 6 says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So if you're talking to somebody that's pro-choice and you're pro-life, that can get very antagonistic very quickly. Anybody can argue. The harder way to live is doing it in a way that you can interact with people and do what Jesus did with those Pharisees over and over and over again. When he met a sinner, he didn't just shame them. He interacted with them. He got a relationship going, and then he gave them the truth in a way that they could understand it. Why? Because he prayed. <laughs> he lived in the hiding place of God's glory, and he's the king of kings, right? It's the honor of kings to search out the matter. God hides it in the secret place, and then we go search it out. And I think, why does he do that? Not because he's mean, but because he knows that people are very vulnerable to the advice that we give. You could go back to Elisha. Remember, the, the mentee, Elijah was the mentor, and he had the, the young prophet that asked for the double mantle, right? I want a double portion. And the younger one was being confronted by Ahab and Jezebel's son, who was the king of the northern kingdom. And Jehoshaphat was on, uh, on Elisha's side. So they came together. I won't go into the whole story, but it's so telling how, how alert Elisha was in the spirit because he knew he had to give a prophetic word, <laughs> But Ahab and Jezebel's son just triggered him like, oh, man, why are you coming to me? Why don't you go to the prophets of your father? <laughs> like, that's not the best attitude for a prophet to have if you're about to give a word. Because you'll speak through your flesh. So he had enough uh, sense, spiritual maturity to understand. He, he's, before he gave the word, he said, bring me a minstrel. You get it? I've got to get in the hiding place of God's glory before I release this word. Because in my condition right now, if I release it, it's going to be God. It's going to be my soul. It's going to be the flesh talking. This is every word that we speak should be filtered through God. Oh. Anybody want to leave right now? Sound like too much work? No, it's, it's a privilege that we have that he gives us. It says in Hebrews 11 that every one of the people that were listed in the hall of faith None of them saw the promise fulfilled, and yet they lived it out because they, they had a dream of going to a better place, a better resurrection. Another day's teaching, but look, we do have the Spirit in us. But if we don't access Him, if we're not asking the Holy Spirit for advice, that's on us. You got a warehouse full of food, and people are starving because you're not giving them access to it. I hope that doesn't sound condemning. I'm trying to encourage you to pray more and to open up your understanding of what prayer really is. It's a dialogue with God all day long, 24-7, higher than 5G bandwidth. <laughs> I already said this part here. I think I can go to the next verse, which is in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And it says, God always makes his grace visible in Christ, who includes us as partners of his endless triumph. <laughs> That's a passion, all right? Let's just think about what he's saying here. Doesn't matter what my background is, right? The thief on the cross, Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. You don't have to hand in a resume to be a Christian. They don't say, well, we'll get back to you and let you know. Faith, it's just on faith. It has nothing to do with your track record, how bad you were. Doesn't matter. The Jews had a really hard time with this about Christianity. And here he's saying, regardless of your background, God will make his grace visible in Christ, and then Christ includes us as his partners of this endless triumph. Through what, though? It says yielded. Can you just look at somebody and say, you got to yield? Mm -hmm. Not easy to yield. I want to hold on my right to be right. Yielding? means pliable, teachable, soft, oil, Holy Spirit, oil, breath of God. Look, I'm, I, I have an eternal perspective. Even if I'm being falsely accused, I have to wait for the Lord to say, I want you to take this to the human resources department or whatever, because many times these are just tests of our metal, right? What we're made of. And the people that are working with us don't even realize they're working spiritual warfare against us because they're living off a different worldview. And their worldview is if you're talented in the office, you're a threat to them sometimes. Right? Well, how, how would Paul have thought about that? It's like, pray for them. Give them a prophetic word. 
Let them know that we're not adversaries. You don't have to feel threatened by anything. Let's just do this together. And that's the good thing about being out with other unsafe people on a regular basis if you're a minister. So you don't forget who God loves. It's easy as a pastor to spend all your time with Christians. But none of the leaders in the Bible did that. Paul even specifically says, even though I have the right to receive compensation, I'm choosing not to. Because I want you to understand it's not about money. It's about your soul. It's about God interacting with you and making you come alive. <laughs> and then, I love this part. You don't need perfume if you're filled with the Holy Spirit because you give off an aroma. <laughs> None of the ladies are saying amen right now. <laughs> You can have both. It says, through our yielded lives, he spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of God everywhere we go. What a picture that is. Talk about convicting. Is he spreading God's fragrance through you on Facebook? Well, there's a fragrance, but is it God's fragrance? <laughs> Look, man, I'm not trying to put anybody down, but emotions are running hot right now on Facebook, right? I, I, Things are being said there that you might end up regretting later. So always pray before you hit sin because it stays up there forever, doesn't it? Yeah. So I don't want to be that city with the walls broken down. I want to rule my spirit, but I can in my own strength. So I'm constantly acknowledging to God. I recognize it's not by my might, my power, my willpower. It's by your spirit working through me. Help me be that yielded vessel, Lord. I want to give off the right fragrance. Yeah. And then 15, he says, we become the unmistakable aroma of the victory of the anointed one to God, a perfume of life to those being saved. And it can be convicting. You know how the rest of that verse goes probably that to those that are perishing, it doesn't smell so good because it means that they're going to have to change their life. So I want to just take a few select verses from Psalm 73 because I think it really addresses some of the practical issues that we face because we do have emotions. We do have feelings. And look, we've never lived in, in a society where there was so much available information. But you'd have to say, not all of it's reliable, right? right. So you end up finding you know, something that looks good and they're, they're feeding you information, but it's not what it appears to be all the time. So you really need to pray and ask the Lord, is this legit? Should I be spending my time on this? Because you can get so hooked on something, you're spending more time reading about the policies than you are the Bible. But... The politics will be ever-changing. This never changes. And the more you spend it here, the more you'll know how to apply it to what we're dealing with in the culture. I'm not saying it's not important. I mean, we've been talking about Lance Wall now for 20 years since we started. And he's been saying the churches need to activate the saints to take over the seven mountains. And it landed on a lot of deaf ears. because His teaching wasn't really implemented the way it could have been. So what did we learn? we got to get involved. You can't just complain about it, but you can get on a local school board. You can run for office. You can say, I want to bring the, the biblical principles, which are all grounded in truth, but you just need to be a reliable person. And I have to say, if you're not willing to do that, then support somebody who is, who's a Christian. And if you're not willing to do either one of those, then you don't really have much of a right to complain. You should be doing something about it, right? Okay. Psalm 73, verse 1. God is really good to Israel. Somebody say amen. amen. That's right. We all know that. God is really good to Israel and to all those with pure hearts. But I nearly missed seeing it for myself. And he repeats it in verse 2. I narrowly missed losing it all. Verse 3. I was stumbling over what I saw with the wicked. That's a word for right now. Okay? Be careful that you're not stumbling over what you see with the wicked based on your definition of the wicked, right? And that's fine. You should be discerning. And we are supposed to test the spirits. But don't let yourself stumble because of that. Ask the Lord, continue to build me up in my immune system so that I can keep that clear word. Bring me a minstrel. I don't want to act out of my flesh. Verse 6, cruelty and violence is part of their lifestyle. They even scoff at God. They're nothing but bullies threatening God's people. And then, here's the big question mark. Have I been foolish to play by the rules and keep my life pure? That's the devil. Planting that seed, it doesn't pay to serve God. Look what happened. You prayed, you prayed, and nothing. You didn't see the result you wanted, so don't bother. No, no, dig in more. Double down. <laughs> Ask for a double portion. 
And then verse 16, oh, just what he said, I'm about to stumble. He says, when I tried to understand it all, I just couldn't. It was too puzzling, too much of a riddle to me. Anybody feeling like that here? I would really like this to be prayer together. Stand if that's you. Like you're just feeling in this swirl of confusion about everything that's going on right now. It's okay. There's nothing to be ashamed of. You're not admitting any kind of weakness. You're just being honest. So, Lord, we just thank you for those that are standing right now. I really understand how confusing the whole thing has been for me, for sure. And, and we say we know that's not your will. And we ask you for the strength right now to come into our hearts. That song we sing, even though I'm in the storm, the storm is not in me. We speak peace to the storms of confusion. Amen. And we say life and godliness and the peace of God to rule and reign as the governor of your soul. And just like this man in, in verse 16, he said, when I tried to understand, I just couldn't. It was too puzzling, too much of a riddle to me. But look what it says next. But then one day, I was brought into the sanctuaries of God. And in the light of glory, my distorted perspective vanished. So I speak that over you. I speak that over you. That the distorted perspective that the world's been trying to feed you will vanish and that you will come into the sanctuary of the Lord. And that peace of God, that presence of his spirit, will bring rest to your soul. That's what I said earlier. We are prisoners of hope. Jesus Christ is the anchor of our soul. And if we're hijacked emotionally, we can't be effective as effective for God. Amen? So we know this is his will. I'm claiming it's done in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, this is so awesome that no matter what we're going through... That when we get brought into the sanctuary and we tune into that hiding place of God's glory, that's what he's saying. When I, when I was brought into the sanctuary in the light of glory, my distorted perspective vanished. I got the reality of the truth of the word of God. Taking away those twisted thoughts and my distorted perspective. And then I understood the destiny of the wicked was near. When I saw all of this, this is a pretty convicting verse. When I saw all of this, what turmoil filled my heart piercing my opinions with your truth. <laughs> Careful with your opinions if they're not lining up with the word of God. Right. Well, I don't want to pray for this president. Wait a minute. That's a direct violation of what we're told in scripture that we're supposed to pray for people in office. We don't get to pick and choose. Right. I mean, you really could argue you should pray more for the people who don't line up with your thinking, that they'll get a revival in their life. That Holy Spirit will show up in the bedroom and give them the reality check that, wait a minute, man, you're in charge of a whole lot of money and people and you're going off the rails. This is how you should be doing it. Because you can't beat a personal experience with the Lord, right? No one could ever argue with you. You got healed, miraculously healed. No one could tell you that God doesn't heal. Thank you. So let's just practice what I'm about to talk about. Lift your hand. Raise your hand. <laughs> I just volunteered you all, so you didn't know that I tricked you. <laughs> this is Isaiah in chapter 6, verse 8. He said, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. <laughs> Here, send me. Right? Whoa. I'm, I'm just looking at Linda, Trisha's sister's down here in the front row, and we see each other all the time, and she'll come home from work, and we live together, and she says, uh, today the Lord allowed me to witness to this person. Today the Lord allowed me to speak to this person. Today I prayed for this person, and then I got a praise report back from the other person I prayed with. You get the theme? It's like, when are you doing your work? It's because she's constantly witnessing and winning people to the Lord. Here I am. Send me. I'm willing. I'll go. So that's what I'm saying, that, that Lance's message is so valuable that we, we are here to occupy until he comes and stop comparing ourselves to somebody else. Well, I'm not as articulate as this person, and I don't have the back. It doesn't matter. If you've got the Holy Ghost and the Word of God, that's all he ever needed. And Paul even said it. It's even better that I don't boast in my strengths because then all the credit will go to God. But it's us being reluctant sometimes to be used. And by not using those muscles of faith, we don't grow them. And what are we embarrassed about, right? Like, what are we afraid of? Nobody wants to be rejected. I get it. But look, in John 17, when 
When Jesus was praying to the Father, this is also a very strong word for right now, for today. Because Jesus was not afraid of the world. Right? He clearly was fearless and you know, set his face like flint to go be executed. So he's not some wimpy Jesus. And we're not supposed to be wimpy Christians either. It takes a lot of courage to really speak the truth in love. And he, Jesus is speaking to the Father now, and he says, I've given them your word. He's talking about us, right? Did you know that he was talking about you all these thousands of years ago? He's talking about us. I've given them your word, and the world has? That's a strong word, isn't it? Why? Why does the world hate us? Well, read Psalm 2. That's where the, that's where the clues are. Why do the heathen rage? And the people plot a vain thing against the Lord and against his anointed one, saying, basically, get off my back. Stop telling me how I'm supposed to live. I want to do whatever I want to do. And we're like, yeah, you can, but man, you will prosper if you learn how to live within the boundaries that God sets for you because his ways are way high above our ways. So I'm not telling you because it's going to be a bad thing. Your life is going to dramatically improve. Would anybody here witness to that, that after you got saved, major problems in your life were solved just by getting saved? Huh. So look, they hate us, but that's because we're not of the world. Jesus is saying, just as I'm not of this world, I don't pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. There's that word that I used earlier today, sanctify, right? We can be sanctified by the truth of the word of God, made holy as we live in an unholy culture. And um, look, I don't talk a lot about, uh, let's just call it critical race theory or some of the other things that are going to start to be popping up, but I know a lot about those things. So I, I've always said, just type in info at King of Kings wc.com, I could send you links to videos if you're trying to understand what's going on, but there's a real attack against the moral fiber of our country. And it's very insidious because there's all new definitions, there's all different words that you think you know what they mean by that word, and that's not what they mean by that word. It's a, it's a complicated thing. You would wonder why would I know all about that is because I have a son that's on a college campus right now, but he graduated, then went to work for eight years, and then went back to get his PhD is what he's trying to get. And he walked back on the campus and it was like, oh my God, it was only eight years ago. What the heck happened? Because the freshmen that he was meeting were in a whole different mindset that he was used to. And it wasn't a good one. So he would send me links because he was looking for advice. Like, I don't know how to navigate these waters. I'm not going into detail now. I'm just saying I could try to help you understand how insidious the attack is. I just don't think we need to do it from here in the pulpit on a Sunday. You talk to me and I'll, I'll get you the information you need. But the, the big thing here is sanctify them by your truth. As they're walking out in the very defiling atmosphere of the world, you sanctify them to be holy people. Not because you pulled them out, but because you allowed them to be in there to be a light in the midst of the darkness. That takes courage. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Are you them? A little louder, please. Yeah, you're them. We're them. We're sent out into the world. Why? Because the light belongs in the darkness. So look at church history. As things have gotten bad, the church shines brighter. Because the darker it gets in the culture, the brighter that we shine. Nothing we have to be afraid of. All right, so John chapter 20, heading down the home stretch. You all know the scene because, you know, we study it at Easter, or, you know, Resurrection Sunday, Passover season. When Jesus is resurrected, he comes into the room where the disciples are hiding in fear, remember? And he didn't have the key to the door, so he just came in the room through the wall, however he did it. And, and he saw them in fear, so he said, peace be with you, right? Because it would be a little, that would shake you up if you saw that. And then when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And again, he said to them, peace be, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, come on, a little louder, please. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. So look, the marching orders are clearly here. However, we got confused into thinking that the Bible is not uh, pertinent to our day-to-day -day living. Let's just break that lie off right now, okay? We, we have to have a voice in the culture or else we're going to see just wicked things going on being called legal because we've drifted too far away from the base of the word, amen? 
All right, so I just want to finish up in a, in a pretty well-known portion of Scripture, especially if you're part of this church. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 and 15. That's a, that's a cornerstone Scripture in one of the teachings in the Possessing Your Vessel class that we run. And it's called Bitter Root Judgments, that particular subject. And this is the text verse for it. Pursue peace with all people. Only those in your political party? No. Oh, all people? all people? Even the ones that you find make you ill? Look, we can agree to disagree on things, but we, we cannot show contempt for God's creation. Amen. And every person is God's creation, so you never get to show contempt. You could say we disagree. This conversation isn't going anywhere productive, so let's give it a break. I don't care how you do it, but if you represent Christ, he didn't shame people. You know I mean? On occasion, you could see the people he got the most upset with were the Pharisees, were the ones that were supposed to be representing the Father to the people. So P... Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Ooh, big one right there, right? So if you don't do that, you'll fall, fall short of the grace of God. Just as God extended grace to you, you're supposed to extend grace to other people. That doesn't mean you ignore the facts. You speak the truth to them in love. You pray and you ask the Lord, I have no idea how I'm going to crack the code of this person because they seem so confused. Here it is. Don't fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by this many are defiled, become defiled. Do you think this is for today? Are there, are there bitter roots springing up in people? Oh, my God. It's the worst I've ever seen uh, on a cultural basis. People are just getting hijacked emotionally. That bitter root that springs up in a Christian defiles many people because we're getting demoted from our place. As the Father sent me, Jesus said, so I'm sending you. The prince of the, of the earth is coming. The prince of this world is coming, but he has nothing in me, Jesus said. Remember? Right. What about me? What about you? Does the enemy have something in me? Well, if we let this root of bitterness spring up in there, yes. Will we be as effective? No. Was Jesus always effective? Yes. So we live in the hiding place of your glory, Lord. And then just going to quickly run through a few verses in, in Matthew chapter 7, which we know is the Sermon on the Mount. And again, you know, we use it in that um, same class, possessing your vessel, but it's good. Even if you've heard it before, just allow the word of God to just come in you and, and soak in you a little bit because there's a verse in here that could be misused in the context of this teaching, right? Don't cast your pearls before swine. We've all probably heard that verse. It doesn't mean the person that disagrees with you is a swine and that you're not supposed to give them the Bible because that would be really contrary, wouldn't it, to what everything we know about Jesus. So if it doesn't mean that, what does it mean? I'm going to just unpack it quickly for you so you have a relevant way to use this. It means that God is a relational God. Right in the Trinity, we see a relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? Right? Why does he say, don't forsake the assembly together with other unbelievers? Because there's something powerful when we come together as a family. Why do we call each other brother and sister? Because in the early days of Christianity, they were leaving their family. They were being rejected. And this was literally like their new family. And we've gotten so far away from that. And we get to so fragile about things. But no, look, we're here for a reason. And the reason is to shift the culture. So in these few verses here, he's giving us a really important formula to help crack that code of how to talk to people you disagree with. Uh, it's a supernatural gift, okay? It doesn't come natural or easy to us. Judge not that you be not judged. Anybody here think you don't judge people? Good, no hands are going up for those of you uh, at home. So... If he's telling us not to do it and we know that it's an easy temptation to fall into, then we have to be intentional about this. It doesn't mean don't be discerning. We do have to be discerning. But that's different than judging because in the text here, the context of this word judging is think less of the person and devalue them. And like I said last week, don't ever say they can't change. They'll never change. That eliminates God from the picture. You can't eliminate God from the picture, so you can't say they'll never change. Because, right, how many stories have we heard of Muslims having Jesus appear to them in their bedroom at night and they're getting saved? That was Rabbi Zacharias' story pretty much, right? So, look, you can't say they'll never change. They might be stubborn. 
But so was I. Don't judge them so that you won't be judged because with the judgment you judge, you will be judged. That's a reciprocity. So God was forgiving of your mistakes. Maybe we should be forgiving of each other's mistakes. Doesn't mean don't tell them the truth, but don't judge them. For with what judgment you judge, you'll be judged back. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eyes, but you don't consider the plank in your own eye? Now, I know you all heard this, right? But this is a very present help verse in this time of trouble that we're in right now. All right? Look in the mirror before you look out the window. <laughs> that's from the book Good to Great. That's not my uh, original thought. But that's, that's what the author said. The best leaders look in the mirror to find out what's my ownership in this before they look out the window to blame everybody else for the problem. Right? That's our job. That's what Jesus is saying. You can't focus on the speck in your brother's eye until you look at your own things and your own issues here. And then he calls them hypocrites, right? How can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your, own, your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, I know that sounds a little theoretical, but here's the deal. You should be one of the best listeners anybody ever met in their life. Why? Because you're a Christian. And why then, as a Christian, you have Holy Spirit. And why then? Because you pray and you spend time in the hiding place of God's glory. And every person you look at, you look past the package, you look past the language that they're using and say, Lord, show me what you see. When, when you look at this person, give me a prophetic word for them. Give me a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. Let me pray for something that they wouldn't expect I would even ask them to pray about. Right? That's all the tools in the toolbox. But if you don't go open the toolbox and you just get loser, right? That's what they used to do in the high school kids. I don't know if they still do that anymore. When does Jesus do this? Aren't you glad? He didn't do it over you. Could he have? Yes. He didn't give up on me. So that's this tricky verse now. Don't give what's holy to the dogs or cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now, I know that's a hard verse because it seems like there's only one way to look at it, but I would say the key is how you look at the word pearls, okay? Because a pearl would not be edible to a pig. Lest they turn and tear you to pieces. See, because you are edible to a pig. <laughs> So the pearls in the context that I believe this is saying is that you're trying to give somebody a sermon. You're trying to lecture somebody on how they're supposed to live because you think you're better than them. And that's a way of showing contempt for people. You didn't take the time to build a relationship and they're not able to hear what you're saying because they feel like you're lecturing them. And it's like the old uh, Charlie Brown. Remember that? The teacher in the front of the class. They shut you off. It's like, who the heck are you to try to lecture me? You don't even know me. You don't know anything about me. You never took the time to even learn anything about me. And you're coming here and giving me these lectures. So the, the, the way you start is by building a relationship. And that comes through prayer. And you say, Lord, I really have a burden for this person in the next cubicle or whoever it is. In my last office, it was the cleaning lady. You know, the people that were coming in after the office closed. There was a whole crew of them, and they most only ever spoke Spanish. Like, you think they're less important to God? No. Every person. You can't even put a price, right? So I, I'm going to skip the rest of the deeper part of that. I guess you could go deeper on it. But as long as you see this as pearls being the wrong language to the right person, don't do that. Don't lecture people. Okay? You with me? I can't tell with these masks on, man. All right, thank you. You could use your voice. So what should I do? If I'm not supposed to lecture them, what should I do? Ask. That's called prayer. <laughs> Ask. What does God love the most? People. How does he want to get to those people? Through people. So the best chance they have of having a revival and getting delivered from drugs and all those cool verses in that song that we sang today, right? I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every addiction because they're from the pit of hell and God has the power to break it and we have the power to help people but not if we're lecturing them. That's what he's saying. 
you got to build a relationship. Get to know them. Let them know that you really care about them before you try to give them advice. Because otherwise, it looks like you're just another notch. I got somebody to say the prayer today. I'm a great evangelist. No, sorry. It's way deeper than that. Ask, and it will be given to you. What will be given? A strategy of how to approach that person, in my example. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be open. Just go to their desk and say, hey, you got time for a cup of coffee tomorrow? I heard you talking about football. I really like football. Well, I don't care. What, whatever way the Lord shows you, say, sure. I'd like, just like to get to know you. What colleges you go to? Whatever. I, you know, you, you're in your world. You figure that part out. God's a relational God. For everyone who asks, receive. So if you'll just ask the Lord, I know you want this person saved. Your word says you don't want one person to perish. How can I be used in that transaction? Go, go to my sister-in-law, Linda. She could write a book about witnessing the people on your job. It's amazing how many lives have been touched. Everywhere she goes, she leaves with more Christians there when she's leaving than when she got there. Isn't that amazing? What a gift. Amen. It's all because she practices. <laughs> she's really good at it because she uses those muscles all the time. What man is there among you who if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone, or if he asks for fish, will give him a serpent? I'm God, he's saying basically here. If you even know how to good give, give good gifts, and you're asking me of how to help somebody know me better, you don't think I'm going to tell you? Are you kidding me? And how many miracles we've heard. I, I was just watching one again, because this guy, Mike Hutchings, that's coming, uh, powerful deliverance ministry, and he was at Randy Clark's meeting teaching, and during the prayer session, uh, there was a bunch of interns there. We were at the Supernatural School of Ministry, and we have a man that attends our church that was the guy that went up for prayer. And there was an absolute miracle that happened, a complete healing from horrendous accident that he had. We should give the Lord a hand for this, okay? Complete healing. <laughs> Miraculous. All from a prophetic word that a student got that never met him before, didn't know him, didn't know anything about it. Because you don't even really have to know too much of the details of the thing they need prayer for. God knows already. You just act in the middle of your conduit. You allow him to pour himself through you. So it's all just ask. He's not going to give you a serpent. I already kind of quoted it. If you being evil already know how, good, how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father? Therefore, Whatever you want men to do. Why don't we stand? This is a good verse to end up. Whatever you want men to do to you, do to them. Man, really? Whatever you want men to do to you, do to them. That's the golden rule. Treat other people the way you want to be treated. I just think part of what we need to focus on right now, this, you know, I said win the war for your altar, right? Win the war for your altar is that we're going to need courage to press in and not just blow people off, but to really ask the Lord, what's the strategy, God? And wait until you get the strategy before you interact with them. Because it's really hard to treat other people the way you'd want to be treated if you were them. You know how you'd want to be treated as you, but he's asking us to go a little further than that. Put yourself in their place. How can you do that? Through Holy Spirit. Help me understand what they're going through. Help me understand how they're processing all this information. If we're not a force for good in America in 2021, if the church isn't leading the way, something's really wrong. There's so many tools in this book about healing relationships, right? And we got to lead by example.